Europe really becomes the Europe we know and love in the summer. It opens up, no longer setting time, it's gone by, isolated countries, insularity sealed in snow and ice. It's easy walking from Chamonix to Martigny. Um, Switzerland, doable. Tour de Mont Blanc is a popular hiking and mountain biking route, usually taken in several legs. Chamonix to Champagne is a moderate, easy tour through the Chamonix Valley, followed by two hard and long climbs to Lac de Champagne. The Tour de Mont Blanc, also known as TMB, is one of the most popular long-distance hikes in the world. The route circles the entire Mont Blanc Massif, which rises to a height of 4,808 metres above sea level, the highest point in Western Europe and the European Union. The hiking route covers a distance of roughly 170 kilometres, 110 miles, with 10 kilometres, 6.2 miles, of ascent, descent, and passes through parts of Switzerland, Italy and France. Alpine flora can be subtle stuff, as well as meadows full at various levels. The average roadside verge is full of flowers, but some of them small and quite weed-like, some little more than buttercups and daisies, in multiple variations of, but also very familiar household plants, native versions that have been, through selective breeding, turned into houseplants. The Alps are original home to the clematis, the aster, the hyacinth. There's a lily and an orchid, but often timid little things compared to what we're used to on steroids. Just quietly sheltering in rock crevices, screeds and snow beds or springs. But when you're walking in the Alps, you do notice these little things, as well as the big, huge vistas. It's strange how your eye gets drawn to things. The flora, subtle. The fauna, not so much with the wolves and the bearded vultures reintroduced. Inspired by our fat map decathlon guide, we might be heading up to the Nivial belt, a uh, cushion plant belt and cryptogamic belt with mosses, lichens and algae, descending from the, the sub that belt, um, 2,600 to eight, 2,800 metres. Pioneer Grasslands Belt, there's the Alpine Belt below that, at approximately 1,300 metres, 1,300 metres, a belt of alpine grasslands and pastures, where the hills are alive with subtle little flowers. From 1,600 to 2,000 metres, there's a sub-alpine belt, um, the mountain belt, 800 to 1,000 metres um, above sea level, um, red beaches, spruce, larches, um, Carnivorous forests sort of start to peter out above that. Um, Arola pines and knee pines and dwarf shrub belt and crowberry, magnolia, vine, cranberries are all on the transition between the tree line where it stops with altitude. Down. Oh, fauna of the Alps. Um, animals. 30 years ago in Switzerland, bearded vultures were reintroduced after extinction, bred back, and the same with wolves. Strangely, I'm not really going to offer an opinion on this one. The bearded vulture used to be widespread in parts of the Alps, but was hunted to extinction towards the end of the 19th century, that's the 1800s. The, in Switzerland, in cantons, and obviously they move around throughout out the Alps, you see plenty in France since reintroduction. The latest birds that have been reintroduced were hatched in Spain and France. The two young vultures will help expand the gene pool within the alpine population, which has suffered malformations linked to inbreeding. Ahead of the release, the beards of the vultures were bleached for identification and monitoring purposes. They're the only living species that mainly eats bone marrow from animal remains. Both bearded vultures and wolves, being vulnerable species, have expensive black breeding facilities to keep the species strong and get stronger. While you're hiking now, you should perhaps be aware that humans are also now threatened by the wolf. Um, 
this chap Joseph Otto, a town councillor in the Alps de Haute Provence, was checking the local water supply when he was surrounded by five wolves, one of which charged him. The former soldier managed to hit the aggressor away. After 30 minutes, the pack withdrew. But that would have been a tense 30 minutes. The incident was the first of aggression towards humans since the wolf came back to France in 1992. The wolves seem to be losing their atavistic fear of humans. The attacks on livestock and close encounters with humans will logically only multiply the National Wolf Pack just in France, which now numbers around a thousand species, is enlarging at between 13 and 20 percent each year. The lupine advances across France is magnificent. Magnificent. Hunted to extinction in the 30s, the wolf returned 30 years ago with a small number of Canis lupus lupus crossed all over the Alps from Italy. Wolves have been seen in over half of metropolitan France's 96 departments. Wolves spread naturally annually. The previous year's cubs depart the main pack to seek territories elsewhere. They've been spotted on the outskirts of Paris and the environs of Dieppe. They've swum rivers, nipped across auto routes. While the Tour de Mont Blanc doesn't climb to the summit of Mont Blanc, the route climbs up and over numerous high alpine passes, providing stunning views in all directions, thanks to a well-developed system of huts, along with towns and hotels along the route. There are numerous options for staying overnight and resupplying as you journey around the loop. Unlike the hiking version of the TMB, the mountain biking version of this route isn't nearly as well defined. Instead, riders can choose from numerous route variants. For this variant, we tried to optimise for maximum time in the saddle and minimum time carrying your bike. This means the tour has several longer segments of paved roads, particularly on the climbs. Start in Chamonix and head northwest, northeast, beg your pardon, through the valley, past Argentière, and on to Le Tour in the direction of Valassine. Here you'll start the first long climb to the first pass at the Col de Bam. This is also the border to Switzerland. Make sure you have your passport. The first big descent is very rocky, single track. There are some tight hairpin turns and exposed sections. Watch out for a couple of steep steps. At the bottom you'll have a short flat ride through the valley, passing to the east of a small village of Beauty. From there you'll start the next short climb to Col de la Vauclaz. Stop here for a snack and a drink before continuing the descent on the road to Les Rapets. There's a few sections of off-road single track on the way down, or you can stick to the road if you're feeling tired. From the bottom you'll start your long, last long climb to Champé. This one is about a thousand metres of vertical, all on the road. It's a rather long, unforget unforgiving climb and unforgettable for that reason, specifically on a mountain bike, but the view of the lake at the top is worth it. Opposite your first climb out of the Chamonix Valley, you'll see two cable cars going up to the vast reservoir at the top of the Châtelard and Guelaz funicular. A vast trough of water in its own V between a perpendicular valley to the Arles. Oh. Wolves also spread unnaturally. Their progress across France is state-aided. In 2018, Macron's centrist government published a 100-page wolf action plan, announcing its intention to increase the number of the predators on the mainland to 500 by 2023. The move was intended to increase biodiversity, or at least the modish type of biodiversity propagated by celebrity ecologists. So Macron could increases green credentials to the surprise of no one in French agriculture. The target figure of the number of wolves was easily doubled by the National Wolf Pack in that time span. After all, the wolf in France has rigorous protection, like the rest of the EU signatories in the 1979 Berne Convention and the 1992 EU Habitats Directive. 
the protected species status means that they can only be controlled by lethal means in exceptional circumstances. Effectively, a flock has to be under direct attack for a farmer to shoot a wolf justifiably. To assuage farmers, the state has agreed a 10% annual cull, undertaken by the Wolf Brigade. From the Office of Hunting and Wildlife, which manifestly failed, ministers have now raised the threshold to 19% annual cull of wolf population. This is unlikely to satisfy French shepherds, or indeed uh, France's dyspeptic tax players. In the event of a wolf attack, livestock breeders receive compensation for a replacement animal. Paris Grant subsidies for the building of electrified wolf defences, reinforced human presence, they call it, assist the shepherds in the breeding of training of livestock guard dogs which are often the Pyrenean mountain dogs, the patou, like in the film. Um, the French government had already financed 5,000 livestock guard dogs and was sloshing out another 38 million in anti-wolf measures and compensation. The cost of protecting sheep from wolves is exploding. 90% of successful attacks take place on farms that have already adopted the protection methods. In a sober, pessimistic report, wolves are probably taking advantage of their legal status as a strictly protected species. They should never have told the wolves. They have learned to circumvent methods of herd protection. It's almost like a challenge. The boom in the patu, cuddly, huge dogs is also causing trouble. They only look cuddly. Shepherds may need a dozen dogs to protect their flocks, and in 105 people reported being bitten by a Pyrenean mountain dog in 2022. A lawyer counts shepherds amongst his clients said there has been a multiplication of conflicts linked to dogs and a notable increase in lawsuits against sheep farmers. Meanwhile, the compensation for dead sheep is inadequate and only covers mortalities. There are indirect impacts of predation. Stressed survivors lose weight, miscarry, reduce their milk supply and sometimes refuse to graze on the places where they've experienced a wolf attack for three years. One breeder who was reimbursed 1850 by the state has estimated her losses at €24,000. UNESCO recognises the value of a pastoral farming environment and the meadows that it creates rather than the forest of the, the boar and the deer that the wolf is intended to keep down. The return of the wolf isn't simply a problem for France. The German wolf pack is growing by 40% annually. The Netherlands to deter wolves from approaching humans. Authorities are experimenting with paintball guns. In Sweden, licenses to kill wolves are being issued to local hunters in blatant disregard of the EU's wolf protection legislation. Faced with farmer protests, the European Parliament last autumn voted to downgrade the wolf's protection status to facilitate more culling. The Commission, however, appears disinclined to take notice. Although one assumes that Ursula von der Leyen the Commission President might be at least lend a sympathetic ear. Dolly, her pet pony, was killed by a wolf in September. I know I shouldn't find that irony amusing. A horse was harmed. And especially in France, it seemed, I don't know about Sweden, hunters don't have a great reputation. They seem to have a knack for shooting hikers and members of their own family, unfortunately. Uh, go hunting with your nephew and you might not end up coming back with a nephew. Shooting just one or two of the pack tends to break up the pack and form more breeding pairs is uh, another problem. So are hikers going to be hindered by walls of electric fences like a prison of war camps for domesticated livestock? 15,000 livestock a year are lost to 140 wolf packs. One female wolf has taken 120 ewes in a year. If you're tottering around a trendy 
Alpine Resort, Courchevel, <laughs> Chamonix, with your little pet toy-sized dog, you might find it vulnerable. If you're taking young children on a hike, they might become vulnerable in the future. Easiest to pray first, isn't it? But don't go harming anyone's pedigree. Imitation wolves. What is it about the severe and the difficult hikes and mountain bikes that attract one? They're the most satisfying. Near Les Contamines, up from Saint-Gervais, Megev area, on the road from Eugene Albertville to Chamonix, basically. There's the Tete Nord de Force Lac Chauvet, near Lac de Roseland, Megev Evasion Mont Blanc. What am I doing now? I'm daydreaming while I'm supervising a Belgian project. Mingle with the Tour de Mont Blanc hikers before going off on less travel trails. The Col de la Croix de Bonhomme and the Jovet Lakes are popular hiking destinations. The easiest way to reach both of these destinations is to follow the Tour de Mont Blanc itinerary. If you're not interested in being surrounded with crowds the whole day, the loop mapped here, although more difficult, should provide you with a more scenic alternative. Instead of taking the large Tour de Mont Blanc trail, follow a narrow trail on your right. The climb is initially steep before levelling off after passing the tree line. You'll be able to see the TMB trail down below on your left and you'll eventually connect with it near the Balm waterfalls. It will be more crowded from there until the Col de la Croix de Bonhomme. Just before the refuge, take the path to Col de Fours where the landscape will become much rockier. At the Tête Nord de Force, enjoy the panoramic view and look down towards the Jauvet Lakes before making your way to them by following the ridgeline. Although the view is breathtaking, pay attention to the trail as it's rather technical. Cold Enclave is not that far, but it will take more time than you'd think to get there. Similarly, the climb down from the Col to the lakes is steep, technical and sometimes exposed. It follows a more alpine alternative to the TMB route, but gets easier as you get closer to the lakes. The lakes will probably be quite busy, although considering this route is quite long, you may get there once the day hikers have already left. Take a scenic trail to get back to the Balm waterfalls, and from there, the classic TMB trail will be the easiest option to finish your hike while offering you a nice selection of restaurants and refuges where you can stop for drinks or dinner. There are outcroppings that have risk and is classed as very remote, which means there's little chance to be seen or helped in case of an accident. Go between June and October for the wildflowers. The Royal Traverse of Mont Blanc, 41 epic kilometres. For the fit acclimatised mid-grain alpinist, this is truly as good as it gets. The route takes three days for most climbers, although it can be done quicker by the truly fit, and as such it requires good conditions and perfect weather forecast. The fact that so many stars must align for this route to be possible make climbing it all the more satisfying. In total, the route covers 41 kilometres of terrain and 5,000 metres of height gain. None of the 41 kilometres is truly technical and none of the 5,000 metres are super steep. But sections of the final day are breathtakingly exposed. As such, you'll need to be as high-level climber to climb this line, but you do need to be a very competent and confident cramponer, able to move quickly, safely and efficiently over various types of snowy ground. If everything comes together, this is an unforgettable trip, culminating in the highest mountain in the Alps.
knowing a place at driving pace and knowing a place at cycling and then hiking pace it can be very different experiences. There is a hiking route from Mont Blanc to the Matterhorn, the Haupt Route Glacier Trek, the highest and most famous mountains in Europe. The Matterhorn, the most distinctive shaped one, Mont Blanc, rather nondescript in form. So much so that there's some uh, finial-like peaks that get passed off by the uh, holiday companies and the transfer drivers to their customers, delivering them to their Mont Blanc View apartments. Which is the Mont Blanc egg? For experienced hikers looking to get into alpine climbing and glaciated treks, this Mont Blanc to Matterhorn is a logical and attainable goal. Before setting off on it, you will need a good level of hill fitness and mountain skill set with encompasses all aspects of glacial travel, from how to rope up and perform crevice rescues, through to micro route finding and making line choices. The trip takes you over the course of eight days between two of the most famous mountain towns in the world, Chamonix and Zermatt. In the course of travelling between those two legendary alpine centres, you'll stay in some gorgeous Swiss mountain huts and travel through huge mountains. The mountain waiting for you at the end of the journey is the most famous of them all, the Matterhorn. And if you make it to the foot of that most celebrated peak, you'll have earned the view. As with all glaciated journeys, this one requires thorough planning and the ability to make and evolve and change plans as conditions and weather develop. As such, take this information as a rough guide rather than a set route which is to be followed metre by metre. This track is a true adventure and should be treated as such. This trip can be done all summer but is safer because the glaciers are covered better and more enjoyable in uh, June or early July. The Shannon hut is closed for renovations in summer 2020 but that's not going to worry us at all. But check because... Uh, all mountain huts need renovating from time to time. If it's not that one, it might be another. From Switzerland's Zermatt, you may be interested in the most famous high alpine journey, the spaghetti tour of Zermatt's 4000 days. But the Mont Blanc to Matterhorn, the Haute Route Glacier Trek, starts in the Arve Valley, of course. A gorgeous day across a wild glacier, seven, eight kilometres and 725 metres um, vertically. There's a scenic cruise of vertical 650 metres down to a chairlift. That only takes an hour or so, five kilometres. And then a different day, uh, three to four hours, 10 kilometres, 1,000 metres uh, vertical climb, hiking, climb. A lovely walk past Lac de Mauvoisin up to a well-positioned hut. Mauvoisin. What does that tra translate to? Is that like bad neighbour or sick neighbour or something? Or am I confusing myself? To the Cabane de Chanrion. High lakes can be a beautiful thing. This is a beautiful hike, but a tough one too. Start at the Mauvoisin Dam parking area and climb quickly up to the dam itself, which is truly spectacular. The drop-off to the north of the dam is stomach-churning, but the panorama to the south is wonderful and allows you to see some of the terrain you'll cover on the trip to the Cabane de Charion. Cross the dam and traverse along the hiker's left side of the Lac Mauvoisin on a beautiful path, maybe called a fackel. The path begins to drift away from the lake and climbs more steeply up zigzags to reach a very long, gradual climb southwards to the moraine of the Glacier de Brenet. The long section of path which takes you to the moraine is utterly stunning, but it takes a long time to try to switch off your brain and enjoy the surroundings without dwelling too much on how long you've been walking for. When you find yourself in Col, the Col de Sophierette, looking down on the Glacier de Brenet's moraine, follow the path as it leads you down and onto the moraine, cross over the toe of the moraine, and go across the glacial river which runs along the foot of it.
no matter how hot the air may be, the water in the river is bone chillingly cold. So make sure you don't slip over the process of crossing it. Traverse out of the Moraine Valley and then walk easily across the Capanda de Charion. The hut is one of the wildest on the whole hut route and is incredibly peaceful. Settle in for a well-earned rest. Take in the alpine wildlife and the picturesqueness of the wildflowers. The next day, take a high and wild walk through some epic scenery. A spectacular day of the Pina de Aorola, the highest point reached on the Haute Route. I think that might have been a Freudian slip, it's not an Aeola, it's a Aroya. Pina de Aroya. Another 8 kilometres and 1,000 metre hiking climb. Mauvoisin was only supposed to take 3 or 4 hours and 10 kilometres. But you're going up the thousand metres and down almost um, 400 metres, you're going to be going some. But to cherry pick a second uh, day out of the whole tour, if you're driving, uh, Caban de Dis to the Caban de Vignette via Pina de Ayo Aroya, not Aeola, is a rewarding way of spending time between 2,800 metres and 3,000. 800 metres in altitude. There's some 24 degree slopes, but you're up 1,000 metres, down 800 metres. A bit of variety for your muscles. Leave the Dis hut and head down into the Glacier de Ceylon. Once on the glacier, climb eastwards to the glacier below the Pont de Seine-Refia. Sticking fairly close to the cliffs above in the upper section, after a brief deviation into the glacier proper, climb upwards again towards the Col de Serpentine. Swing east again along the plateau of the reach of the conspicuous steep section known as the Serpentine. This steep slope can be hard packed or icy, and the steep drops off the Sarax to the left lie very close to the track, meaning that a fall could be fatal. Also, there are often crevices as the angle eases. Continue over the Col de Brunet towards the Col just below the Pina de Agoya summit, from where a short deviation takes you directly to the summit. The view from the top is fabulous and you'll be able to pick out numerous 4,000ers as well as some equally beautiful but slightly lower summits like Mont Blanc de Seillon and uh, Lervig. Descend the east side of the mountain down to approximately 3,400 metres, avoiding the steepest sections of the slope. Close to some small rock buttresses, the best decent swings to the right south before heading back to the north to avoid the cliffs. Aim for the Col de Vignettes and then descend easily to the hut, which lies in the heart of some wild scenery. Soak it all in and toast your ascent of the highest peak you'll climb all week. Less cheat accessible the next day. A long, beautiful and circuitous day through some desolate mountains. 14 kilometres worth of it and 11, 1200 metres of vertical hike. Ascending. After that there's 12 kilometres and 700 metres uh, ascent to a rugged day which takes you to within distant, touching distance of Zermatt. A gentle day, a downhill stroll into Zermatt past some epic scenery. Should only take you two or three hours, though it's 12 kilometres. You do go up, oh, oh, 22 metres. From the Schoenbiel hut to Zermatt. After that's gone before, today feels very easy and it's still over 10 kilometres and entails just over a thousand metres of descent, so don't leave it too late to get away from the Schoenbiel hut. You may be doing this in reverse. 
Once you do get walking, the vistas just keep on coming with the Matterhorn, dominating the view to the right, and the Monterosso Massif, revealing itself straight ahead. Castor, Pollux and the Brithorn also become visible throughout the day, so this hike is a peak spotter's dream. The hiking trails you follow today are all well trodden and clear, and there are no glaciers to cross, so your rope and crampons can be put away for good. A trail leads you through glassy meadows and over rolling moraine crests as you head down into Zmut, a traditional Swiss farming village, which has been remarkably well preserved. There are a couple of charming little cafes to stop in Zmut, so enjoy your return to thick air, green grass, warm air, and grabbing a coffee and a cake at one of them. Suitably refreshed, continue down a large tourist track which leads you into Zermatt town centre after a week in the high mountains <laughs> or a cherry picking drive between Chamonix and Zermatt. The luxuries of Zermatt feel uh, wonderful and you will have earned every calorie you eat and every second you spend in a hot shower. The town is home to some excellent restaurants and bars, so there are plenty of opportunities to toast your trip. When you wake up in Zermatt, the next morning ride the clean and efficient Swiss train network back to Chamonix. There are train stops between the two, which offer hiking opportunities. There is an add-on, though, the uh, Albert Premier Hut to Char a Million. An accessible and beautifully situated high mountain hut with a variety of approaches. There are three options for reaching the hut. One five hours, another three hours, and a final two-hour option. <laughs> All converge 40 minutes below the hut and allow you to access one of the most dramatically placed huts in the area. All involve walking up and downhill or on uneven terrain and have a real high mountain feel. The hut sits at just 2,700 metres and enjoys wonderful views across the glacier and up to the dramatic Aigues de Chardonnette. The three options all begin at the village. 1,450 metre Latour village at the northeast end of the Chamonix Valley, which can be reached by bus or car via a 20 minute drive from Chamonix Centre. The two shorter options for reaching the hut both begin at Le Tour Lift system, ride the Charmillion cable car to the 1850 metres and enter either walk on a good well signposted trail eastwards and upwards to the Lac de Charmillion 2,200-300 metres <coughs> to continue up to the Autant chairlift. 2,200 metres and follow a good trail south as it gradually climbs to the Lac de Charmillion. From the Lac, the lake, that is, both routes converge and the path then climbs and traverses towards the Glacier de Tour. Keep following it to the moraine north of the glacier and then follow a rocky path up to the hut. The option from the top of the Charmillon cable takes three hours going from the top of the Autant Rocher lift takes two. It's away from help but it's easily accessed and as most of the tour.